Well, I'm going to give you a, um, a quick potted history of the landscape we're in, of the site. I'm not going to go into the prehistory of the site itself so much as go into the prehistory, if you like, of the project, everything leading up to our HLF bid and the evolution of this landscape and the fate and the development of this site over, over the best part of a couple of hundred years. First of all, we need to indulge me in a bit of uh, personal mythology about this site. Um, I want to talk about two origin myths that are very up in my head um, about this site. One is the ghost story about Whitehawk Hill. Remember, you're actually on Whitehawk Hill now. You're in this property. This ghost story relates to the whole hill. The story goes that the squire of Wooding Dean, Squire Elnor, um, his daughter, a bit of a miscreant, came here to the races, probably sometime in the late 18th century. That's a bit kind of uh, vague at the moment. And she um, disappeared, suspected, murdered. Her ghost, as the white lady of White Hawk, was seen around here on numerous occasions. But it wasn't until the bones of a female were discovered by workmen digging on the hill that the last appearance of her ghost was seen and her body was laid to rest. Now, there was no squire that we can find historically um, of that name, of, of Wooding, Wooding Dean. Um, but any digging around this hill, as we know, has a high chance of finding human re remains. I think there may be a nugget of truth to this myth, and that nugget of truth may be the discovery of a skeleton. There's another myth that I carry, uh, which is, uh, this is the skeleton of the second uh, Whitehawk female burial that was discovered at this site. And when I was a child, it used to be on display in Brian and Hope Museum. And I was taken there by my parents because apparently my great grandfather, who was a labourer in Brighton, um, worked probably for Kerwin, digging in the 1930s, and discovered this. And so it was a source of great family pride. I had a phobia of skeletons as a child, so I found it absolutely terrifying to go there, um, but it was kind of embedded. Since doing some family history, I found out my great-grandfather on my mother's side actually had one arm. So the idea of him being um, a labourer in the 1930s doesn't quite ring true anymore, but still, it's there um, as a myth. In fact, sort of personally, this hill was at the epicentre of where I grew up. You can't see these things, but these are all points within a kilometre of here. I was born 400 metres away in Brighton General Hospital. My brother was born 800 metres away in East Sussex. County Council Hospital, over there are the graveyards, Woodvale Crematorium, down in the cemetery, the Wooden Cemetery, the big Brighton mausoleums, where all my gra great-grandparents are, all my grandparents are, my parents will go there and I will go there. My experience of this hill is not unique. If you live in, grow up in Brighton, it's on this hill that you're born and it's into this hill that you will go when you die. This is, you know, the... Uh, kind of epicenter of the psychogeography of life and death in East Brighton. So it was amazing for me to become involved, coming back to Brighton after university, in this site and eventually in this project. So even though I'm a Paleolithic archaeologist, my interest in this site was very um, deeply personal. You are on the northern fringes of the site, but just to give you an indication of, of where we are, we're sitting in East Brighton, on Whitehawk Hill, even though most people in Brighton refer to this as the Race Hill. And this is an outline of the site. If I just go and sort of unpack it a bit, we've got four ovoid concentric circuits, and the race course buildings are just here. So we're, we're actually probably overlying the northern limit. Those of you who want to attend, we're running two uh, tours of the site to completely unpack it. There's going to be one at two and one at four. Uh, four. So, yeah. There's um, a list downstairs. But maybe at the end of this session, if you want to go and see the great views of the monument, uh, we, can, we can give you a talk through from that window over there. And this is how the monument sits on the hill. This is Kerwin's uh, uh, survey overlaying on the, on the hill itself. And Whitehawk Hill sits in the uh, Whitehawk Causeway enclosure sits in the saddle between Whitehawk Hill to the south, where the transmitter is, and the slight prominence we're on here, where the race course is. It drapes over, unless you've got an aerial view or a view from a building, you cannot, in any place on the site, see the entire monument um, in its entirety. But you can, and have always been able to see, the monument from distance in Brighton. You can see this hill way out five or six. Uh, 
uh, well, five or six kilometers away, you can see the banks and the ditches of the site. You can imagine when the site was first dug and laid out, it would be very, very conspicuous in the landscape. So let's take you through the, the history of the hill. Here's an early 19th century uh, oil painting um, view of the hill from, from 1846, showing a kind of pastoral bucolic um, idyll. We've got a couple of shepherds here, some sheep. Thanks to Paul, sheep have finally come back to the hill. At this point in time, Whitehawk Hill was known as Whitehawk Down. It was one of the sheep grazing downs um, above Brighton, you can see that Brighton itself hasn't extended out onto the hills. The nearest development here is Thomas Attree's Italianette um, little estate that he started building around Queen's Park now. You can, can't see Attree Villa anymore. It was demolished a few years ago, but uh, the adjacent villa is still there and the pepper pot is still there. But they're the only traces of this, this estate. But the rest of it is fairly pristine grassland. We think these two shepherds are sat next to a, a now defunct or filled in dew pond. But you can see it's bare open landscape. And it's within this landscape that we get the um, first kind of activity that takes place up here, which has a big impact on the hill. And that's the race course itself, um, which is still here. This is really, you know, a really embedded long-term historical bit of land use of it. It was uh, opened by and presided over by the Duke of Richmond. Um, so you had the aristocracy coming here. Um, Queen Victoria visited here once. But you also had uh, all kinds of social problems going on around the race course. It was the place that, uh, like poor um, uh, Miss Elmore, people were warned against going to. And the first big ecological in impact on the hill was the cutting down of bushes around the um, race course to stop prostitutes plying their trade after the, uh, the races took place. But it was still open enough that in 1821, the Reverend Skinner, an antiquarian, made what we know as being the first record of it. Here's a view of Whitehawk Hill from the east, probably sat above Whitehawk um, Valley on, on what's now Wilson's Avenue. And you can see in his very rudimentary sketch, he shows the race hill and he shows grandstand buildings here. We've got a record of a building here on Whitehawk Hill itself, where the transmitter mark now is. I don't know what that building was, but you've got a side view, and this is what I said about not being able to see the whole monument. You've got the side view of the outer two banks and ditches draping over that ridge, very clearly visible from the east. And they're still visible as built monuments when the sun is fairly low um, from the east. And here's his plan, looking something like a water beetle. Um, of the site, um, he was able to notice two tangential, uh, what we now know to be Bronze Age ditches, and he mapped the oval <coughs> circumference and the interrupted ditches of the two outer circuits of the Whitehall Causeway enclosure. He interpreted those interruptions as being modern breakthroughs through for paths and access, and it was very much interpreted as being a hill fall at that point in time. But it's a very early record of, of Whitehall Hill as a Field monument. If we just go through the evolution of the site and the impact upon it, it's very much then the history of the expansion of Brighton, the expansion of Brighton suburbs, intensification of land use, making a, a progressive impact. Salami slicing the site in places, dividing it up like pizza and others, and uh, creating uh, lots of quite significant impact. So if we look at Whitehawk Hill, on the first OS, in, um, OS map edition, you can see that the only impact are a series of fairly innocuous trails going over the site. The trail going to the north is a very established path that we call um, in Brighton Jugs Lane. It used to be the main market route to Lewis. So that was fairly, uh, fairly established. But the race course is probably the only impact you can see up there in the northwest where you've got the extension of the race course coming in and taking out the circuits in the far northwestern quarter. By the end of the 19th century, we've got more significant impacts. We have the establishment of Whitehawk um, Road, which is now the trackway running straight through the site, and we get the expansion of allotments and small holdings right up to the boundary of the monument itself. We also get a phase of expanded development of the race course at this point in time. Then in the 20th century, let's get through that one, in the 20th century, we get more significant impacts. We get the leveling out 
of this um, area on the outer circuit to create a compound for race going vehicles, horses and carts. And then by the 1960s, we get more significant developments of the, uh, of the race course coming right into that northwestern sector. And by this time, we've had the road going through as well. So it's being divided up and partitioned over time. There are some significant interventions in this. Um, the Kerwins um, carry out rescue excavations, both ahead of the road and the gas main going in, and eventually when the pulling up ground of the uh, race course itself is extended, some very significant excavations take place in the 1930s. But that's about it in terms of any formal intervention. The crisis point, um, and I wasn't in Brighton at this point in time for, for White Walk, was this development, um, which is now known as Monument View. There's other um, <laughs> place names in the little housing estate, like Causeway Drive and uh, you know, Bank and Ditch Close. Um, this took place and slipped through the net of any kind of planning was when uh, Brighton's conservation officer was cycling up here when the houses were already going up that it was first realized they were building on the outer circuit of the, uh, of the monument itself. When we take you on the tour, we'll show you where they've actually marked out on the pavement where parts of the outer ditches go through the housing estate itself. Not only does it have a direct impact on the monument, a scheduled monument, um, it also has an impact on the skyline, breaking the skyline and cutting off views of the monument from the rest of the town, which was so spectacular um, before. Um, so, just showing you where archaeological interventions took place. Here's the interventions along the road by the Kerwins. Um, here's uh, monitoring that Archaeology Southeast and other units have taken place of, uh, um, of pipelines and other services that have gone into the monument on a small scale over the, over the years. Um, and then I must mention that after Monument View was, was built, there, our predecessor, the field unit, did come in to try and do some remedial excavations and assess what had been destroyed. So there was a small opportunity there to look at uh, what the impact of Monument View had been. And I think all of these impacts frame Whitehawk's position very much as an urban ed edgeland in close proximity to dense urban settlement, but in fact a gateway to um, the rural, more open landscapes of the Downs. And because it's been on the margins, through the 90s there were lots of other impacts on the monument that caused concern. There was regular traveller encampments here which had an impact, occasional parties, at one point digging a stage out of one of the banks and ditches, lots of fly tipping, it was used for drug addiction, um, and even overdose victims were found up here, lots of joy riding. Um, and it came to a place where you didn't really want to bring your family for a picnic. I remember coming here for a picnic, but in the 90s it did become uh, yeah, quite marginalised. The last stage, just leading up to our involvement, was what really happened at the end of the 90s, the development of the Friends of Whitehawk Hill um, as a community group very much focused on the ecology of this site, um, coordinated by David Bangs, carrying out an ecological survey here, um, and helping, working together with Brighton Hope City Council to eventually designate the site as a nature reserve. Their uh, banner there, Friends of Whitehawk Hill, shows the Whitehawk soldier beetle, a unique species found on the hill, which became the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the symbol of Whitehawk's very special ecological place in the landscape. And then in the very early 2000s, with Brighton and Hove Archaeological Society, Brighton and Hove Council, both the Parks Department and the Planning Department, um, we set up an informal working group that met a few times a year to discuss major issues and discuss how we were going to protect the archaeology and actually lead to the interpretation of the archaeology. And it's very much out of that that the partnership we're going to be talking about today was sprung. So I will leave it there. Thank you.